Cool. Awesome. Um, yeah, this is the Rex check-in call for October 2021 on October 13th. Bo, how are you guys doing? Uh, mm, lots of uh, big house troubles, like uh, the, the foundation underneath of the house is sinking, and I have to have it fixed. And yeah. so this old house is really hitting me upside the head with expenses. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah, yeah. Foundation work is no fun. Contractors are really busy now. Yes. <laughs> yes, they are. So, are they having are they having staffing problems like everybody else? Oh God, yes. Yeah. How, yeah. Huge, <laughs> huge. I just had a roof replaced, um, and uh, and now I'm deciding. I'm finally getting around to getting some work done up in my 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 lair, my attic, and uh, it's crazy. I mean, the contractor can't find anybody. How do roofers even get out to your property? <laughs> <laughs> like, like don't they have like a, don't they have like a big truck with lots of big ladders to get up on your roof and all yeah, like they do they have a big truck and they really wanted to know how they were going to get in and i said look you can have two you know there's room for a concrete truck your truck you know uh, and there's even room to pass concrete trucks can pass each other i've i've seen it happen so they made a trial run fabulous and they decided they could do it that's great. Okay. That's great. Okay. That's great. The work is all done now. Uh, that's done. The roof is done. Cool. Turns out, uh, I have seventy one hundred square feet of roof. <laughs> so, what, so you replaced <laughs> you replaced all the roof on the main building on the house. Yes, and on and on the uh, garage as well. Oh my God! So all new roof. It's all did new you, roof everywhere. Did you replace it with Tesla power tiles? I did not. I, uh, I, I had Tesla out here actually. And um, Teddy was very keen to go Tesla. And so we spent a year trying to get them out here um, off and on. And they finally came and they did their measurements. They wanted me to do the measurements. I said, I'm sorry, there's no place I can take pictures that will measure what you need to see. Uh, and so they came out and they walked around and everything else and took their measurements. And they said, there's not enough sun. Too many trees and too much in the shade of the hill? Too many trees, mostly, yeah. And a lot in the shade, the backside all, all in the shade in the hill, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's too bad. Well, we're but we're getting new solar systems. Oh, interesting. Yeah. yeah. But there's, uh, and it will have a Tesla power wall. Oh, good. And there, the problem is that the Tesla power walls are hard to get. So I, I can imagine that the, the new, suburban chic will be having some old junker Teslas up on jacks behind your house that will be like playing the role of a power wall. You'll be like, oh, those aren't junkers. That's actually my backup power system. Exactly. That would be <laughs> nice, wouldn't it? Yeah. And you something, could even something. We're getting we're pushing the end of the batteries and we're pushing the end of the the end of the generator and it's not happy. Oh man. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not like it's not like a foundation. Okay. I understand that, but it is still an important part of the infrastructure. Exactly, exactly. So Shamay, do you know how to jump the queue for a power wall? No, no, I, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a fan of space Jesus, so. You're not a fan of what? Elon Musk, oh. space Jesus is the, the term that I've heard. Oh! <laughs> I mean, I have, we have a Tesla wonderful. car. So would you not, are you telling me you would not buy a power wall because it's Tesla? Uh, I would think twice about it. Um, I would look to see if look for alternatives, but at this point, I think the power wall is pretty much the only one in the game um, at the moment, at least. Only one I've seen. Um, and well, so like when, when we bought our electric car, Tesla really was the only plausible option for what yeah. we what we needed. Yeah. Um, so, but uh, Musk just skeeves me out. I just don't want. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. I'll put it this way. As much as we're happy, you know, reasonably happy with our Tesla car, we're not going to buy another one. Aha. Uh -huh. What would you buy? Or do you know? Uh, don't know yet. It'll be whatever's, on, you know, look at what's on the market at that point. Um, but there are definitely some good alternatives out there. Um, you know, and uh, if, if the uh, 
Biden bill passes resume, you know, with at least some of it intact, then there'll be a huge discount on American built, union built mm -hmm. uh, electric vehicles. So, which I, I, I love in part because it does piss off Musk because he, he's anti, very anti union. Mm -hmm. yes. Speaking of union, I just, uh, a friend of mine is part of IATSE, mm -hmm. the, uh, uh, the uh, television and, and screen workers uh, uh, union. Mm -hmm. They have now called called for the strike to begin uh, Monday at twelve oh one a.m. Pacific time. You uh, uh, I didn't I didn't know there was a strike brewing. Yes. Oh yeah. Uh, basically, all of the companies, you know, Netflix, Disney, etc., all these companies that do streaming, keep screwing over the workers with contracts and with making mm -hmm. demands because the streaming stuff was never really woven into the contracts they had before so people are working 12 plus hour days without the right kind of compensation not being fed properly a lot of covid safe, safety stuff and the uh these produ production houses have just been dragging their feet on making improvements and so i actually says our contract is up and unless you they said about two weeks ago unless you take this seriously we're going to go on strike and they just announced that they have now have a strike date so if the production houses don't get their shit in gear by, you know, by the weekend, then we're going to see every kind of production, movie, television, streaming, everything shut down. So wait, is this going to postpone our Bridgerton binge watching? You can watch stuff that's already been made. I know. I'm so you feel free to, to watch reruns of The Office over and over again. Oh, God, I can't stand The Office. I do not. Cringe humor is not my kind of humor. Anybody else? Yeah. I can't yeah, do no, I, I, humor. Like Larry David makes me like makes my skin call. Like I just can't watch stuff he does. He's like, it's like. I want to hear Jamey's reaction to uh, Apple's doing the Foundation series. Have you been watching that? Yes. Uh, I haven't. I was actually planning on watching it this weekend. Um, the uh, we haven't gotten around. We hadn't hadn't gotten around to subscribing to Apple TV Plus whatever until. Um, so one thing you can do if you have a bunch of Apple devices in your family is you can set up a family plan that shares a whole bunch of crap. So shares the iCloud storage, shares the apps you download, videos, whatever. Um, and it all gets billed to a single credit card, mine in this particular case. And my parents, which I put on the family plan so they could actually get reasonable backups for their phones, um, have a bad habit of accidentally subscribing to things that uh, like my mom just subscribed to Apple Music. I was like, Jesus, you're not paying for this, you know. Um, and my father to Apple TV Plus. So this time I said, well, screw it. They, they took care of the subscription side of things. We get to use it, so we'll use it. We're paying for it anyway. Yep. And don't forget you get free Apple Plus if you bought an Apple product in the last year. So I have never even paid for it. If you buy a phone or anything, you get it. Oh, I didn't know that. You well, know, it's, give it's you a, year? a bit more complicated than that, but um, because um, I bought a an iPhone 13 Pro because I hadn't updated in a number of a phone in a number of years, um, and that offer didn't come through because um, I don't remember what it was. But anyway, if you have bought more than one and you rejected the offer or didn't go with the offer for an earlier device you purchased, and then that doesn't come for the second one. And, I'm getting too deep into my own consumer habits, so let's move on. <laughs> so um, worker uh, unskilled labor wages are going up. So, I mean, really going up. So uh, that's gonna help the inequality gap. Um, and so this, this, there's a lot of good news actually in the economy right now. Yeah, so one of Biden's weaknesses, I think is expectation management. Um, for example, uh, the idea that Kabul is not going to fall in a hurry, like he made a statement like, oh, you know, even if we withdraw, it's not going to fall real fast. And then Kabul gone. Now he looks like an it, like a moron. And I think there were a bunch of people saying, hey, this is a house of cards. If we back out, it's going to fall. And he just, nobody was listening to those people, which is usually what happens with good forecasters. Right. Right, Jemay? Yeah. <laughs> um, 
And, and so on this one, I think, in a, I think between supply chain, complete cock-ups, uh, labor shortages, rising wages, which is fantastic, and a bunch of other stuff, some inflation is inevitable. Like, like we're, and I'm no economist, but uh, I and uh, but I think we're heading straight for some inflation and he needs to prep, prep people mentally for it, or he's just going to be blamed for the inflation, you know, right before the election. And then who knows what happens. No, I, I've been preparing for inflation now for uh, over a year. Uh, so the inflation's going up for a lot of reasons, but most likely I could bottom line it for you. M2 is going up, but money supply is not enough. Um, the money has got into people's hands. In 08, 09, when they, they pushed money in the economy to save it, it just went on bank balance sheets and the banks didn't loan the money. So the money essentially never hit the real economy. It got trapped. Right. So in this instance, when, when the government was giving money, thank God, for COVID, they were directly like monetized. They, that money went into people's real hands. Right. Mm -hmm. It also it also paid off some of their debt. Yeah. So this time, it, and so this none of this is bad. And, and inflation itself, anyway. So, so the money really hit the real economy this time. And the other big problem is not big problem. The other thing that's going on in the economy is that um, you have a record amount of debt. We are back to World War II levels of debt. Now, of course, this is just because of COVID. This is because of the last, you know, 15, 20 years. We've just been building this debt, you know, including the tax cuts Trump did to give capital yet more money. They because it, because it didn't money. have enough. It just they, they just didn't have enough money on hand. Yeah, cool. America, cool. With, with the discount window wide open and all that, there just wasn't enough money for them to grab. Right. So um the, what we're likely to see, and you'll sometimes hear this term, financial repression is a term they utilize. So um, the government, well, last time they were in this much debt was World War II. And, um, and we're talking not, you know, not absolute levels and economic, you know, finance, all you care about is relative levels, like percentage of GDP. So essentially GDP is your national income and your debt level is whatever percentage of that it is. So we're back up to that kind of level. And uh, we're not the only one. I mean, Europe's in that. So you know, basically across the Western world, all these Western economies are in that kind of debt. So the last time, the way they got out of it was they, in a very artful way, stole from the rich to pay for it. And they're going to do it again. And uh, it's, it's quite beautiful, actually. <laughs> what they do is inflation runs hot, and then they hold down, the Federal Reserve holds down treasury bill rates, interest rates on T-bills. And they, they did that throughout World War II. Inflation would go skyrocket up 15% and T-bills were paying 2%. And in this way, they were able to essentially do a massive transfer of wealth from the wealthy to the other side. And uh, it's called financial repression because essentially there's nowhere to go. When they hold the interest rates down like that on treasury bills, your only place to go left is the stock market and go with the risk. And essentially the huge amount of money out there just doesn't do that. And it, and it directly transfers the wealth back. So we're back into what, what Ray Dalio talks about this. And it's, it's really neat. It's very neat it's historical stuff. Because it's been happening for like 100, like for the last 700 years, um, our nations have done this game to get out of debt. And the, so th that's what's going on. So it's, well, I'm, it's, I'll be fine because I'm all in on GameStop and uh, um, Bitcoin. <laughs> Bitcoin. Bitcoin is your safe. Bitcoin is stealing gold thunder as an inflation hedge. And I definitely want to talk about blockchain because I saw you um, did some stuff, uh, Jim A, you did some things like that. So a lot to talk about on blockchain. Yeah. And it's not crypto. Crypto is like the first manifestation of blockchain. There's just so much that's going to happen because of blockchain. And uh, essentially think decentralized, trustworthy database and uh, 20% of the economy is involved in what is, is about to get hit with what blockchain can do. And, you know, crypto is just basically a little piece, a little sideshow. What will it do to the 20%? I mean, what, would that, what will it do to, well, how does that work? So what's so beautiful about decentralized um, uh, trust, uh, trustworthy database is, um, so 20 so everything that's record-based susan like um here's where i foresee and a lot of the stuff i haven't read so i'm just projecting out my own thoughts about how this is going to work so eventually you have a let's talk about like money when they like cryptocurrency and this is just one use case so um right now most dollars you know are not physical dollars they're just an entry on wells fargo's you know journal saying 
you have this much money. Yeah. So the fact of the matter is most money is already digital, period. Uh, so, but what do you do? You trust Wells Fargo's journal. Wells Fargo knows how much money I have and I trust them. Um, there's all kinds of entities throughout the economy this is going on with. So anything that's like a record like that is ripe for being turned into a blockchain database. And a blockchain database is essentially a bunch of nodes maintain the database, right? And it's trustworthy. Now there's, I can get into how that works and everything, but I foresee things like uh, driver's licenses, uh, deeds to houses, um, the deed to your car, your, your title to your car. And I think a lot of these blockchain databases will actually be like between the states and the federal government, or the uh -huh. state, the state uh -huh. insurance companies, the states and automobile manufacturers. Because if you think about it right now, when you go get a car, you go to a dealership, you buy it. The dealership basically says, so Bo bought a car. And then the insurance company says, Bo bought insurance from us. And, yeah. you know, and the bank says, yep, we loan them the money. Every one of those things could just go into a blockchain and every one of the nodes could just be the bank. It could be the bank, the, the auto company, the dealership and the insurance company and the state. So all those records, it's gonna be actually really beautifully efficient. In fact, one of the things I think these blockchain people are really missing out on is they keep thinking this is going to dissolve governments. It's going to like pour acid on governments. In actual fact, um, this this is going to be a, a way for governments to be much more efficient. I mean, so why not when you pay Social Security? That could be on a blockchain. That your employment record could be on a blockchain. Essentially, if we had the, the, this kind of records on it, and the government keeps a lot of these kind of records. So twenty percent of the economy I'm talking about is everybody that keeps a record. The more you know, you know, everybody that keeps a record. I mean, essentially, once this all gets, um, you know, not gets into a blockchain, and this is simply software eating the world, which Andreessen admits he stole that from um, Buckminster Fuller, <laughs> Buckminster Fuller's idea. Um, it, this is software is going to eat these stupid records, and these records really deserve to just be put on a decentralized trust. Well, absolutely, yes. Uh, so, I okay, I'm beginning to get it, and there's a lot to like about this. Um, so I want to speed this up just so oh, yeah. if your employment and everything was on that blockchain. Do you realize when the government wanted to send money and figure out if someone was employed, they could just do it literally in a matter of days instead of like right now where a lot of this money that's still not reached people from COVID oh, yeah. is poor bureaucrats going, hey, prove to us you're employed, prove to us you're, you know, prove to us all these things. Right, right. So those things right. could all be on blockchains. Literally, government is going to end up being so much more efficient it's going to be wonderful. Transactions are not identifiable to a human. So the government won't know that you're employed or unemployed because they won't know that whatever you're spending or taking in is, is you because each of those transactions ought not to be pegged to your identity. They don't have to be, but they can be. Yeah, There but isn't something that, that makes that impossible. No, it's it's not, just, it's not how, is this, how is the mechanism constructed? Right. It's not that it's um, impossible. It's just that it's sort of either voluntary or regulatorily imposed, right? Well, like, think about it. Why not when you pay so, when Social Security, when your employer pays Social Security for you and everything like that, that could just be a blockchain-based thing with the government. And I'm mm -hmm. talking, I think a lot of these, these, these blockchains are actually going to be between the states and between the states and the federal government. It just makes beautiful sense. And they'll be the notes. It'll be their database, their distributed database. It's just a beautiful thing for them to do. It just solves so many of their problems. There's also, uh, I want to give you one more like final really big thing for this. So um, China, of course, is already digitizing the renminbi. They're already doing it. And that's one of the reasons they, they want, there's a lot of reasons they want that Bitcoin out of China. First of all, they hate capital flight. They're always afraid of it and they should be. They don't want money flying out of the country. But the next thing is, is they're introducing the digital renminbi. They're gonna have, and this is gonna allow them surveillance capabilities, which are just really frightening. But um, for, for the rest of the world, Western world, um, and by the way, every bank and every, every central bank and every bank in, America, in the world is hiring people in this technology like crazy. The job wrecks you know, are just out of control because they're not gonna die, they're gonna adapt. They're gonna get slammed. They're gonna get, you know, they're gonna have to change. But anyways, once money becomes purely digital, economics is gonna go from a theoretical science to like, oh, just query the blockchain inflation so the theories that we have and all these tremendous statistical techniques we have to do holy moly when when money is truly digital on a blockchain 
you can go and just query the chain. Is inflation happening? When we do this, can this so, happen? But the blockchain is a sequence of encrypted transactions about which you know very little, except that this amount of, of uh, Bitcoin went from A to B. And you don't even really know who A and, A and B are or why, why it was exchanged. How are you going to just query the blockchain? No, you're, you're, a wrong, blockchain. you're wrong about how much is obscured on the blockchain. In fact, uh, frankly, that's why they've been able to, to track down a bunch of these criminals. There's a lot on the blockchain. And in fact, the Federal Reserve, I mean, anyway, so no, I disagree with that, Jerry. The blockchain actually um, has a lot more data and it, it's always showing where, where it went from and where it's going to. Uh, with the Nobel Prizes. That's totally different from blockchain, but that's, you know, experimental no, economics is, is huge. Is, yes, it's, but it is a, part of this move to, to uh, data informed economics and not just yeah. free. Yeah. yeah, right. So me, it's going to revolutionize economics. Like it's just, it's going to turn it from, hey, you know, just, just, well, look, here it is. There it is, man. It's, it's really, it has some amazing possibilities for what it's going to do. It's going to just completely change economics. Jamir, are you agreed on how much uh, how much information the blockchain exposes? I, I, I'm I I agree with Bo that it actually exposes quite a bit of information. And Bitcoin is, is constructed in a way to hide ownership, but that is purely a construction of Bitcoin. That's not a that's not inherent to blockchain. Blockchain is basically distributed records. If you want to be overly simplistic about it, you have copied your database across hundreds or thousands or millions of computers and locked it up with a with a particular kind of encryption. But and then every time a change is made, that gets replicated across all of the copies of the database, so that there is no uh, there is no single point of failure. It's there are hundreds or thousands or millions of points of failure, uh, potential points of failure, or ways to basically replicate and hold hold data true. Um, and I, I, the block, the way the blockchain works is that, you know, literally new data is added onto the end of it. So the whole thing, the whole record of everything that has happened in that, that particular area, whether it's money or, uh, property records or whatever, every single change is, is recorded on that chain. So nothing is ever lost. So it actually, there, it, car it will carry a lot of information and depends on what and how much information is revealed. It's going to depend on how much information is put into the database that is that is uh, in, uh, that is intrinsic to that particular blockchain. The, so what, so how, do things, have, how do things become interesting to, to blockchain? I'm sorry. What, what do you mean? Sorry, sorry. How how do things become? Uh, how are they added to it? No, I know how they're added to it. What I want to know is what makes it um, intrinsic to a particular chunk of blockchain. It's the rules. So one of the, one of the things that people are talking about as a blockchain use is what they call smart contracts or self-executing contracts. That essentially it's a set of rules that you know that then replicated across you know the whole system um, that. Should a particular condition be be met, then there's a whole bunch of things that happen as a result. And you know that's a particular kind, a particular use of blockchain that is simply that is the data and in, you know, information and algorithms that get encoded into that particular piece, that particular use of blockchain. There is there is no single in, <clears throat> intrinsic to every single blockchain item other than it's a replicated database. You know, and there are problems with that. You know, there, there are a whole bunch of energy issues about how you do the verification. And there are, you know, and you don't the, have the to conventional do way of doing this. You don't have to you don't do have it the same way at all. You don't have to, you don't have to, but that has been the most common way. And there's not, there is not a, at least as of what I've seen, there is not a single point of agreement as to what the alternative methodology should be. Um, did you so get the, the energy. Did you, get my, right? did you get my idea where, Essentially, I haven't read this. I just came up, you know, thinking about it. Like driver's licenses and and and, and things for cars. That instead of it being, you know, spending all that energy with independent miners, if you trust the nodes, if the nodes are states, if the nodes are like auto companies, you know, if the nodes are interested actors, because literally that's the way the paper trail already works. Yes. Okay. So here's right. here's the issue. Here's the issue. The a blockchain system is more trustable the more nodes there are. I know. Because you need to have 
fifty percent plus one of the nodes to be able to control the content. But I also think that wait, wait, wait. So if, you, if you only have fifty nodes, then bad actor, bad actor G O P needs to only to have control over twenty six of them to basically be able to have control over the entire network. You know, because blockchain is is dependent upon the information that is solely dependent upon the information that gets stored in the nodes and replicated across. So if you control the replication, you control the levers of power. And, and if, you you have a hundred, if you have 100 million nodes, it's really difficult to do that. If you have 50, it's really easy. The other thing that I wanted to call out, or the, yeah, the other thing I wanted to call out was simply the, um, the potential for errors being hard, hard written. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. I'm, I'm thinking about the no-fly list. Yeah. Uh, the no-fly database. It is rife with error, but that if you put it into something that it is, is now seen as the official unchangeable document mm -hmm. or very hard to change document, it because these errors, which are gonna continue to happen that, you know, with people involved in, this, in operating in government, it's going to happen. Actually, in actually they could be maliciously, uh, and they could they be could, done maliciously. They could be totally added on purpose. You could do a denial of service attack on blockchain. It'd be pretty easy. Yeah. So, you know, I think that block blockchain as a way of maintaining uh, usable databases is great. Sorry, God, Jerry, what happened? I'm oh, in yeah, a room. Controlled lights. Right? I'm in a room with a motion controller, and where I sit, it doesn't notice me, and so I have to stand up now. I, I just changed rooms. where I, here at Ziva. And I haven't figured out how to fool the motion sensor into noticing that I'm actually here all the time. So every, every 30 minutes, I, I go pitch black. So, so sorry Jimmy, to shock you. Sorry to shock uh, you. I don't know if you know anyone that figured this out. Um, Jimmy, let's go through how smart contracts could essentially end the insurance company for one. There's so many beautiful things to go down. But go oh, yeah, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that blockchain is an evil technology. I'm no, just, I'm, I'm, what I am saying is that it's not a perfect technology. But I, I and have, it certainly, I have a concrete. point. For, like I think that the people haven't even thought through. What if you trust the nodes? Like right now, what is your? How do you get a car title? Essentially, the state believes a car company, believes a dealership, believes a bank, and a whole bunch of reasons. Like I think eventually, cars, like the blockchain, will include the car manufacturer, the dealer, and in fact, the same record of the car moving from the manufacturer to the dealer will be part of the tax record that the IRS will use. So if you include enough parties that you already trust, who all already have an interest in it, I think you don't actually need to worry about the 51% takeover distributed database thing. Aha. Uh -huh. Bo, I think you have a really idealized vision of what the blockchain is. The blockchain is not a big queryable database. The blockchain is a concatenation of encrypted records, none of which divulge a lot of information about what happened. And you, it, you can't go and say, hey, here's what Jerry bought at Safeway by querying the, the blockchain. Even if all those records were put on the blockchain, which they aren't now, you could not query the blockchain. You could try to suck down the blockchain and do a lot of reverse, you could try to reverse engineer the transactions. The way they catch criminals through the blockchain is they actually, to a, they fig, there's a timestamp on every transaction. So this amount of, B, of of Bitcoin moved from two entities at this second, and we have evidence that this, this transaction happened on this computer at the same second. If we can correlate that, we, can ha we have some circumstantial evidence that this criminal did this thing. But, but this is not a nice, big, beautiful database. This is just a series of transactions, some of which are fucked up, some of which are wrong, right? And, and irreversible because you can only add to the blockchain. Jerry, it, it, it precisely it is a queryable on. database. You are exactly wrong. It is precisely is a queryable database. That's what it is. Now, seriously, about where? Here. Show me. Show me proof. Um, you're, you're, you're talking about Jerry. Remember, we're talking about blockchain technology, not the particular implementation. That's Bitcoin. Bingo. Bitcoin ha has a whole bunch mm -hmm. of intentional limitations on it to right. prevent. That's uh, right. you know, To prevent a lot of things. Prevent to keep it comparatively anonymous. And so that's why they have to do this kind of inferential data 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 discovery, okay. you know, around times of transactions. But that's that's purely a Bitcoin issue, not a blockchain intrinsic issue. So show me a blockchain that is a queryable database anywhere. I mean, I'm, I agree that I agree that in principle is is totally feasible. But sure. also also the idea that my like my driver's license 
and insurance records and accident records and healthcare records would all end up on one or several queryable blockchains that are queryable in the way that Bo is envisioning seems actually sort of impossible to me. Well, I think the DMV already has one. We're just talking about a distributed DMV database between the states. Yeah, and this is basically because Bitcoin has been the most visible implementation of blockchain, blockchain it really gets um, uh, generalized to everybody. Yeah, basically, well, what it means is that basically the two of them get conflated all the time. Right. You know, and so what we're, when we're talking about blockchain, blockchain is a particular kind of database technology that makes for, you know, m it replicates across multiple devices to basically make, to ensure consistency and to maintain a, sing a, um, a queryable set of, in you know, set of information about whatever. Whatever. And I don't know the about the queryable part. So I mean, queryable in a sense. Of, it's a, I, I think we could help Jerry out if you explain the use case of artists and music and, and blockchain with uh, smart contracts and how that could work. And that, I think Jerry could really help. So the smart understand. contracts don't happen on normal blockchain. They happen over on, on Ether, like, like Ethereum. We, e normal Ethereum blockchain? is a blockchain system. What right, is the normal blockchain it, distinction? Blo you know, exactly. Keep going, Jerry. Go ahead, I, I, I'm curious. I'm trying to figure out what Jerry is, where Jerry is going with this because Ethereum is a blockchain system. Right. Exactly. It's based like, on it top doesn't of work blockchain. on a normal computer. It only works on an IBM. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. All these systems are layered, right? There's layers and layers of stuff that are, that are happening. Um, and then we really haven't talked about the energy consumption because it's, it's actually a travesty right now. And there are some yes, energy. And that's, a, that's a function of a particular way of doing verification of the data. And that doesn't, the verification, there are alternative methods that are harder to do. And they have, there hasn't been a single decision on what the alternative methods should be across systems because doing data, data verification by calculation um, is, is easy. I'm sorry? Versus proof of stake. So yeah, there are different yeah. ways, Jerry. And also there's a, that, that's not gonna kill blockchain at all. That's, that will be, that's being dealt with. But let's explain the use case for music, Jamey, because I think it's a thing close to Jerry's heart and how smart contracts tied with a blockchain of who, who created what music could just help artists like on a, it's a beautiful use case. I'd actually prefer you to, to describe it because um, I have, I don't know if I, if I could to give it the, the, the detail that you could. <laughs> I don't know if I could, okay. So the smart contracts, Jerry, so Ethereum, Ethereum is the one we're talking and let's literally take Bitcoin and put it over there. It's really a very specialized um, thing and you shouldn't, Ethereum is the one that's really got the potential. It's just a distributed database that can run computer code and look for conditions. So you can literally, if you had a blockchain that said, okay, anybody that creates music, you know, let's encode it on this blockchain. And we're gonna, and so whatever music, every, every creator is tied to what they created. And then literally that person could just go and say, okay, this is how much I charge for this. And this is how much I charge for that. If you play it in a TV commercial, if you put it on your YouTube video and, and it can literally just go query the blockchain and, and get them a micro payment right there, boom, through the blockchain, through a micro, so that, and the whole transaction could just be between computers and simply the blockchain literally. So I'm, I'm not, I'm probably not explaining this, I'm going really fast because we're all a little heated here. But for what it could do for artists, it's just gonna be astonishing. And instead of sitting there with negotiations between record companies, but literally set your condition. The minute you use it, it's going to be in the digital sphere anyway. As soon as you play that music, the computers are going to know you're playing this music. And they're like, okay, well, that person owns the music. Okay, give them a micropayment, done. Literally, it could be such that, that you could put it in your YouTube video, for example, and it doesn't get charged until somebody plays the YouTube video. It's not a, it's, so you, you could literally do that, Jerry. It's beautiful. It doesn't happen magically. The systems have to be programmed to use it. Right. And so YouTube would have to be programmed to make use of it. But what where Bo, Bo's going with this is that because the system is done algorithmically, is set up algorithmically, you can have it very specific conditions that get met 
to have very specific results because it's all and and, and this is the critical part where for the blockchain it's replicated across you know dozens there are dozens of us um, it's replicated across thousands or more systems that all that all can verify each other that this is the rule yeah and the that's the the value of blockchain in principle is that kind of cross verification because if it was just a single database owned by ascap right or some then ascap could make any kind of do any kind of changes and no one could do anything about it because it happens behind the scenes it's the one database and look this is what the database says it must be right whereas you have a blockchain listing of music ownership um, that then can be tied into systems like you know for micro payments then you have that kind of cross verification to make it very difficult to manipulate so it's a trust machine i mean the economists i remember when i was really digging the technology i just realized oh my god it's a technological solution for trust it's a technological solution for trust and then i go digging into my economists you know records and they call it the trust machine. They wrote an article about it like three years ago. I went, oh, this is the trust machine. And I went, oh my God. And if you really think about how many things go on in human relations and economic relations, they're all about trust. That's why I tried to explain Wells Fargo and money. You trust- Oh, who are you talking to? Look, look who you're talking to here. You're talking, yeah, talking to the trust guy. Direction. I know. <laughs> the trust guy. And so I actually think he, no. if, I know, if I know Jerry, his reaction is to me, that's not, a, that's an artificial version, artificial replication to try to make trust you know, to art to have artificial trust trust is as a human interaction um not really i'm kind of okay i'm kind of and I, this is worth slowing down and talking about a lot um so they call blockchain or whatever the trustless system right and i'm like actually no it's not we're trusting that uh satoshi's algorithms actually play out and that the maths and these things work like we're, we're trusting that the genesis block of bitcoin is actually trustworthy and findable and nobody knows who satoshi is and nobody knows where the genesis block of bitcoin is or whatever else you know whatever else is going on nobody actually knows those things so everything we're talking about is built on a bunch of acts of faith that are technological and mathematical but are still kind of acts of faith that could basically blow and then the assumptions that you're talking about jamay like um, the, the corruptibility of the network, you know, uh, 50% plus one of the servers and all that, right. I, think are, I think are pretty true. And I think those assumptions are being violated all the time as people experiment at higher levels and get abstracted away from the foundational, uh, you know, workings of the system. So I'm really interested in all these things on top. And I, I think NFTs and smart contracts are really exciting. I think there's all sorts of potential to pay artists. I agree, but, but I don't think that Ethereum is a vast queryable database. I think that someone could use their Ethereum information and present it in a way that's queryable. That's cool. But the Ethereum network itself is a, a layer of smart. I mean, like if you if you if you posted a, 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 an agreement with Bo on Ethereum, could I go read all the terms of your contract? Is it, is everything on Ethereum exposed openly like that? Is that how it works? Yep. It's a trust. Yep. It seriously? Is. No, no, no. I mean, seriously, are you assuming this or do you know this? No, I know this. I mean, this is a big deal. This is a big deal because that means every contract posted to Ethereum is completely open source. Is that correct? Yep. Yes, it is. It's not encrypted. You're, you're happy to just to, 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 to proclaim that as, as true. So all it, I don't I don't know. It, all it does is run code. And and yep. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, I do, however, have a friend who's been working, um, Vinay Gupta. You might know who he is. Oh, I know Vinay. He's crazy, but he's good. He's smart. Yeah, but he, he's been he's been at Ethereum from from early on. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, if you have questions, particular questions, I'd be happy to run them run them past him. If you want to get in on you know from the inside perspective. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, are Ethereum smart contracts public? Composability, smart contracts are public on Ethereum and can be thought of as open APIs. That means you can call other smart contracts in your own smart contract to greatly extend what's possible. Contracts can even deploy other contracts. Um, yeah, the, the, the only thing, the, the thing where you're, you're getting this idea from is, is um, 
Bitcoin where they they really they want to hide who's who owns it. But even that is very hard to do. But that that's anyways. Yes, Jerry, it is open because Ethereum just runs code. It literally runs computer in a runs uh, computer code in a box. So anyway, I don't want to get and, and again, just toss Bitcoin out the window. It's not a good example of blockchain. Please do that. Please do that. Um, but, so, Bitcoin, but Bitcoin, as a proof of case, has proven though very well that this example is is well. You've got miners in China, miners in America, miners in Europe, and it's been running now for so and so years, and it's and it's not been broken. It has not. No one has been able to to take over the, the blockchain and a bunch that, of oh, that we that we know of. Well, that, no, yeah, so there's actually a whole bunch of controversy around that, around Bitcoin, the forking of Bitcoin, who owns the particular machines that, that run the, this one particular fork of Bitcoin. It's, again, toss Bitcoin out the window when yeah. it comes to it using it as an example for anything. And also, don't, don't drink quite as much Kool-Aid, though, because you're like, you're all in on this. Like, you know, like you sound like you're completely you're, believing the whole, the whole narrative. You sound like, A, you don't fully understand it, and B, you're literally, I mean, there's going to be lots of implementations of this and think of it as just a decentralized database. So in so the world we live in today, we're just dealing with, with centralized databases that we trust. We trust Wells Fargo. We trust the federal reserve. I don't trust we Wells Fargo. Fargo. Are you shitting me? Did well, you see, did you see the crap they were pulling? You have a bank account with them. You're essentially, whether you like it or not, you're trusting them. And well, then you don't yeah. have a bank account. Right. Yeah. Yeah, right. I don't. We we canceled our Wells Fargo account. But you do have a bank account with Bank of America, right? or it's some I must have a bank account you. someplace, and I'm trying to figure out who where exactly. Well, look, we already the whole world operates on a bunch of centralized ledgers that we already agree with. You you trust if you own a house that the, the yeah. state of Oregon or the county of blah 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 has a record that you own it. It's just another centralized data. Let me let me state the motives for or the motivation for my skepticism and I, I will claim that I don't know how all these moving parts work and this conversation is leaving me with a whole bunch of questions to go like look up. Um, but I watched in 2008-2009 as a whole bunch of humans on earth poured all their money into CDOs and CDSs which had flawed math under the hood because nobody had checked the downside risk and, and there was a there was a downside risk assumption that was wrong that was baked into the entire fucking system right at the root level. And once everybody was jumping on this, on this carousel, everybody else had to jump on the carousel. If you read the big short and watch the movie, like the six people who sort of figured this out and bet against the, you know, bet to make money from the collapse, they would never want to replicate this activity again in their lives because everybody in their world hated them. It was like running against the stream was almost impossible. And when I read Michael Lewis's little article, it's the economy doom cup about a little retirement, a, a teacher's retirement fund in Northern Germany that went bust because of the global financial crisis. I was like, oh crap. Every, they got everybody to pour their money into one system. Then a few people jumped off the carousel before everybody else cashed in. John Paulson made bazillions of dollars from this. So did Goldman and everybody else got slammed, right? So, so. I watched that happen with a whole bunch of smart people saying, this is great, we're gonna, nah, nah, nah. I'm hearing the same vibe and I see a lot of stuff that could be, isn't necessarily, but could be at just as flawed as, oops, we forgot to check the downside risk. And by the way, when you don't factor in downside risk, you're obviously gonna have higher than average returns, right? And then, and then there's corruptions in the system that show up like the ratings agencies were giving junk bonds, AAA ratings. I mean, junk derivatives, AAA ratings, which was clearly not, should never have been happening and hasn't been fixed. So, and that's a separate crisis from what we're talking about here. So I'm looking, I'm looking for the possible weak, the, the cracks in the foundation that 10 years from now we'll be like, oh shit, we all poured our money into the blockchain, Ethereum, what have you. And then, man, we were wrong because then the whole thing fell apart. Uh, and I'm not saying that's going to happen. I'm saying like, I'm smelling like a plot I've seen before. I, I would say, first of all, this is kind of an argument from accident, just because this happened, it, the financial system wasn't thrown out. The financial system always suffers from financial innovation where actors outrun the regulator yeah. and they do all kinds of things that the regulators didn't even understand. And that's half of the situation. Regulators, regulators are always behind things. In fact, you're seeing that happen right now in blockchain. The regulators are sitting there trying to figure out how to do this. And, and they're like, oh my God, uh, it, it's a whole new world that's evolved in front of them. And this is all that's happening. Blockchain is simply a technology which we can now have decentralized 
trustworthy databases. That's it. That's all it is, Jerry, period. And um, anyone that understands a centralized database should be able to understand a decentralized database and the value therefrom. It's simply a technology. So I think I put it this way. There is no, there are no inherent technical reasons why somebody couldn't set up a, set up a um, broken scam like CDOs, whatever, using blockchain as an underlying technology because the underlying technology is um, neutral to bet is not, it's, it's agnostic. Yeah, it's it's use agnostic. Um, you're, you're disagreeing, Bo. No, that's it. Exactly. Yeah. It's just okay. a technology. That's it. And so it, it, it would not be, it, it would not be at all shocking to me if there was some kind of financial system fuckery that happens using blockchain, but it wouldn't be happening because it's blockchain. Beautiful. It would be happening because it's fuckery. Uh, <laughs> it's just like, it's like saying, you know, you can have fuckery, you can have the financial system fuckery, whether you're using, uh, digital dollars, fiat currency, or gold, you know, gold-backed currency. You have you know, maybe a different kind of fuckery, but fuckery remains possible. I love this term, um, fuckery. It's great. <laughs> uh, so uh, what I think you and Bo are not as in so much disagreement as you as it may seem. They're at, you're just talking at different angles. Um, you are complete, Jerry. You, Jerry, are completely correct in saying that there are there is a um, a kind of halo around blockchain right now for a lot of people that make it seem like it's that make it sound like it's magical technology that'll fix everything. And you know, and I have to admit, Bo, that some of what you were saying about how it'll make government great and efficient that really that felt it was redolent. Do you know what I want? Me. I'm trying to say something about but, but um, <laughs> that doesn't mean that blockchain is the opposite. There is there aren't horns on it either. It is a an agnostic technology of, of verification and database replication that is that can be done in a very efficient way. That is hard. That is hard, but not impossible. Hard to break. And has the potential to make some things happen, you know, some tr kinds of transactions happen either automatically or with greater efficiency. However, it is a human technology. Will it will and has been abused? It will be and has been abused. And you know, fuckery remains possible. Where where, where I think uh, for Bo, what I think Jerry's getting at is that the because the technology remains hard for some people to grasp and remains in the hands of people who um, have uh, have great appreciation of their own skills <laughs> um, the like there is a potentially higher likelihood of fuckery that can take place because of this because people can be bamboozled more e more readily um, I think both of those are true that I wanna, you know, this, this I basically wanna... these are the angles of your of your images on my screen. You know, Jerry is correct about the fuckery. Bo is correct about the efficiency. But what that leads to is really hi highly efficient fuckery. Yeah, and I would like to say one of the reasons I, I'm saying how government would be better. I'm actually trying to say something against the greater blockchain community, and specifically the libertarian idea that somehow they're going to destroy banks. And destroy government. I mean, I, I literally, I am actually highlighting. And when later on, I'm sure in a year, I hope in the future years, you understand what I'm trying to do. I'm saying, no, this is not going to knock down governments. Yes, no. it will greatly transform banks. Banks are going to have to innovate and find a new place to be. But in, in a lot of ways, there are, banks still have very vital th functions to serve. So when I was saying government's going to be more efficient uh, that is completely contrary to what the blockchain community is saying every day oh, yeah. the well, community is saying things like government's done we are not we're going to be able to escape governments entirely and set up our own little crypto states blah 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 that's why i'm saying wrong wrong actually this is going to be a, a boon to governments and they will figure it out did you read yeah, the long I, read I, about the sea setting ship yeah, yeah. So i'm trying to uh, actually uh, go oh against the, the 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 blockchain um you know, elect 
who are now just endlessly going on about how governments are over and everything wrong. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think anyone on this call or anyone who would call into this call would be likely to fall for that particular interpretation of reality. Um, you know, for one thing, we tend to be there. Are, I don't think there are any teenagers who regularly call in. Um, <laughs> and most of the stuff you know, on Twitter from blockchain of likers and stuff like that is just drivel. It's drivel. And it's very similar to like 1999, you know, the uh, dot com stuff like, you know, pets.com is rife. It's all over the place right now. Agreed. OK, I'm done. Go ahead, Jerry. Mr. Clark, you've just missed a, a fun and heated conversation about blockchain, Bitcoin, the future of the world and everything. <laughs> yeah, not Bitcoin. Um, Pass it aside. Um, We're not talking about Bitcoin. OK, well, uh, I'll just add my two cents uh, that, you know, people who are only talking about blockchain don't understand the larger domain of digital ledger technologies, and they're fixated on some subculture or cult of blockchain uh, that, you know, needs to, you know, need to expand their thinking. Nice. Which Got is it. roughly what Bo was saying. And I'll also <laughs> say that, you know, cryptocurrencies are simply the, um, the new thing that was needed once we made bearer bonds illegal, right, for the criminals of the planet to be able to move uh, value across borders without being detected. Yeah, no. I'm done. <laughs> don't, don't, forget, don't forget how billionaires have like fly into to Switzerland and they have all the storage facilities where they put all the works of arts and everything to keep them out of, you know. So yes, the fungibility of, of cryptocurrencies is a very useful tool for not just criminals, but I guess you could call the real criminals, the billionaires of the world. <laughs> criminals. criminals. Yeah, yeah, I mean, the, yeah, I, I, you, know, you know, criminality you know, extends into many domains of human deceit. And how about those Pandora papers? Oh yeah. That how about them? <laughs> I saw that oh, on the times. Yeah. I, I hope none of these reporters get killed. Like with the, the reporter who's behind the Panama Papers. Mm. So Kevin, that was a very useful uh, summary. We I much appreciate it. <laughs> I, I have get, I, I, you can tell I've given it. I, I'm on the other side of the conversation where I've distilled it into sound bites because my opinion has, you know, you know you know, evolved toward the end of simplicity as opposed to complexity. So I'll tell you the way I think about it, and then maybe this will be the end of it, is that TCIP is an underpins the internet. This is another technology, a distributed database tr that are trustworthy or trustful. Mm -hmm. that, this is just another technology like that, but it's a big one. And it's got one in, it's 20% of the economy is ripe for being sucked up into the cloud. Well, one piece of the broader conversation here is the D-Web, the distributed web, and how much that's going to happen over the next period. And it seems to be moving strong on lots of different fronts, not just sort of cryptocurrencies and distributed ledgers. Just in time, huh? Isn't it? I mean, we're kind sitting of. there with one, one monopoly asshole after another, Google, Facebook, Amazon. But it's, we but could it, use some decentralization, couldn't we? Yeah, but it's still impossible to replicate what Facebook does with D-Web apps, like not quite doable yet. Yeah, I got a little e-web server in my basement, so yeah. You might need an exterminator for that because you're getting a lot of webs. Yeah, okay, I mean, I'm done. Uh, <laughs> all right, uh, Jamey, Jamey, uh, pick a new topic. Shake the magic uh, eight ball and uh, tell us a completely different topic we should focus on for the last stretch of our call. Oh, now you put me on the spot. Um, Something else that's juicy for you. It can even be, oh, well, doom. come on, let's just figure out what's happening with um, the, the latest variant of the virus and how I guess we're really going to end up living with it, just like the common, mm. just like the flu or something, influenza. So mm. we're shifting out. So let's talk about that. Well, yeah, you got uh, Delta is becoming endemic. Um, and uh, the the uh, partisanization of the vaccine anti-vaccine uh, structure is kind of is horrifyingly fascinating. Yes, um, because it's become just 
it, it's getting worse every day in, in that that split. Uh, you know, to the point where it's actually starting to have uh, um, follow-on effects or side effects against uh, other kinds of vaccination, where there's some people questioning getting a uh, you know, vaccines for everything, uh, other things, everything. everything. Yeah, yeah. But but also like heating people up about vaccines really serves a bunch of different things, including undermining elections. So so what's happening here is. People are getting like really, really pissed at public officials and the cost of being a public official just shot through the roof. And it's mostly, sorry for the lighting again, mostly these people <laughs> don't, don't, don't get paid much or at all. There we go. Come on, little detector. This is getting Kafka-esque. <laughs> now we're back. I know. I think it detects when I say something it doesn't like and shuts the lights off on me. Um, but but I'm seeing you know a, a piece of a piece of what the Republican Party is trying to do right now is make sure that all at the local level, everything works in the favor of Republicans so that the next election, no matter what the popular vote is, they win the election. Yeah. Um, and they're they're being systematic and clever and brutal about it. Very very brutal about it. And you know the, the videos of people being threatened and we know where you live. You're not going to get away with this kind of shit. That's being done intentionally. And, and the anti-masking and all of, all of that is, is part and parcel of how do you heat people up enough that you can run the table and keep winning elections? And we're in the middle of that. And I, I don't know how to defuse it. I, I'd love to hear great ideas on how to take the energy out of that. I don't know. Uh, and it, I think you're absolutely right. And that this is uh, there is a larger goal here. And the attacks on the infrastructure of elections, the political infrastructure of elections at the local and state level is far more important than whatever, you know, the latest outrage from Trump. Yeah, this because is because that's going to, that'll go beyond Trump's uh, life, lifetime. You know, if you have these, the system going in to make it so that the Secretary of State has no, has no control over the elections at this if the secretary of, of a state secretary of state of a particular state happens to be a democrat if you put in these these uh, tools to make it possible to overthrow the popular vote and do so in a way that that is quote unquote legal it's going to be um the 22 election is going to be chaotic the 24 election could be could be catastrophic, catastrophic. yeah and I don't know if there is a way to get past that that doesn't involve a lot of people changing their mind. Because right now the Democratic Party is being cautious because it has a, his it has a history of being cautious, but also it has learned that if it gets too aggressive, then a lot, a lot of the social political infrastructure, mass media like tends to turn against it. Um, the accusations of being a radical are much more har harmful to Democrats than to Republicans. Um, and sadly, you know, it's the Overton window, <laughs> but uh, you know, and so you have a situation where we'll see examples of this in twenty two, and there will be a lot. There will be court cases. There will be people yelling. Um, hopefully, nothing, nothing more than yelling. Um, but to, if it's not broken down after that, then 24, we will get whoever's Republican as, as president, rather, no, no matter the vote. So historically, in a fight, historically, but in a fight, usually often the person with the least to lose and who's willing to go the furthest wins the fight. Um, and this is the problem with peaceful societies. I was reading Howard Zinn's old piece about Columbus, because Columbus Day was Monday, and somebody floated, hey, here's Zinn's old essay about, about this is the real Columbus, who was brutal and, and was welcomed. <clears throat> like the Taino people were like, dude, here you are, here's our stuff. <clears throat> and he's reporting back to England how generous these people are, and we could take everything with just a couple soldiers. Um, and, and, you know, you know the rest of, the rest of how that plot plays out. Um, so this has happened over and over and over again. And a peaceful society that's actually trying to sort of nurture the commons and the, and the people is usually victimized by somebody with uh, sharper, sharper swords and more gunpowder. Um, so my question is, how do you become like a puffer fish? 
Like, like the puffer fish's only defense is spikes on its outside. And when, some, when another fish tries to eat it, it's like, and then the other fish will barf it out because, ow, I didn't like that. That was awful. Um, well, eventually and, you're going to have like a Jonestown, you know, loyalty where the people realize that they're being, you know, sacrificed, you know, at the altar of what they've worshipped. But and they, those people all died. They didn't I, leave. Well, that's okay because the demographics are arcing toward, you know, a lot of them are going to die. Now you will have, go ahead. Between immigration and the coronavirus lopsided deaths, you would think that the demographics would be like kicking in at 2022, 2024. I'm not reading that at all. Mm. I'm not reading that at all. And also in, in, in part, it's because a lot of Latinos are much more conservative than you think they are. Oh, I, and no, if, you no saw John, if you saw John Oliver this, this past weekend, a lot of the um, stuff that YouTube and Facebook has been, has been taking down for misinformation, if it's done in Spanish, is not being taken down. Oh, so wow. a lot of that anti-vax, you know, uh, mm -hmm. all the real crap misinformation is spreading like wildfire in the Latin, Latin, Spanish-speaking community in the United States. Wow. Wow. They, they, they don't have the capacity to work multi you know, nationally in this country. The, the stat that, that Oliver, John Oliver used was that 20% uh, of Facebook's use is English language, 80% of their fact-checking is English language. Mm, that's, right. that, that's what I was trying to say. And I used the wrong term. I meant multicultural, not multinational. No, uh, but I, I knew what you, you meant. Um, yeah. You know, that whether it's capacity or focus or whatever, I mean, it, well, we know that, always, think, that outside of the United States, Facebook is not a social media. It's a utility, right, that facilitates commerce and facilitates banking and facilitates a whole bunch of other stuff. It's built into the fabric of everyday life. You know, I can get through a day without Facebook. There are places in other parts of the world where you can't get through the day without Facebook. There are definitely places that can't get through the day without WhatsApp. Yeah, Facebook, that's true. Facebook, Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. WhatsApp 100%. is globally or, much bigger than Facebook. Or WeChat. Yeah, WhatsApp is absolutely WeChat. critical and owned WeChat. by. Facebook. So I don't know, Kevin, if you know different, let me know. But um, you, you can, in, in WeChat and all those other apps, you can actually run all of your transactions, do all of your reviews, run your maps, do, run your whole day. I don't think Facebook has that feature in any country. Well, I mean, it's just, it has more functionality elsewhere, right? Yeah. Um, that's all I'm trying to indicate. And you're right. WeChat is much more pervasive, in fact, because I have to use WeChat right. to communicate with people in China. I have a completely separate Android phone that only has that installed because when you install it, it sucks up all of your address book and everything else. Yeah. So I have a WeChat phone, right? right? You can have everything that's not on this phone, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, makes total sense. You know, yeah. I was and you know, anyway, so you have this, you know, that, that's actually, a, that's a really good idea. Uh, for, especially for China, it's also not just WeChat, it's, um, or not just, you know, sorry, WeChat is China, is, is massive in China. WhatsApp is global. Yes. 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 100%. Yeah. And you can live your life inside of WeChat comfortably. And the Chinese government is happy with that because they've got their nose under the tent. Um, I assume that's possible to do with WhatsApp. WhatsApp is has mechanisms to allow transactions, and uh, that was one of the big the big deals with that outage last week or this past week uh, was that it yeah it took down Facebook and Instagram and Americans were, were whining about that, but globally it knocked down the econ the economies for countries yes. all took, over the world mm -hmm. for that day. Yeah, people could not do could not run their businesses, could not engage in banking. Yeah, if I can just go back to what Please. you were observing about. Hispanic, and I use that term generally, um, there is a huge intra-cultural caste system inside the Hispanic community, right? And, you know, there, there's a, I could, Jerry, you remember, I could never hold a Latin American industry advisory council or customer advisory council in Latin America. I had to hold it in Miami because there was no country that was neutral enough, right? It was impossible to, to host it on terra firma Latin America. It, it could not be accomplished. And, you know, the, you know, so 
what we're seeing play out there is something that's you know pretty much as ancient as you know um, what we see play out in the Middle East, right? In terms of you know having deep suspicions all the way to hatreds, all right? That play out, and there's you know whole notionalities of some Hispanics, you know, cultures are better than others, right? Um, superior to others, and so we've imported that too. Right. There's a, a diagram I'll find and share in a sec, but it was a diagram of Spanish castes, the, the caste yeah. system, with with names for all of the different sort of you know, uh, it, it's a little bit like uh, you know quatroons and octoroons and all of that. Uh, among among African Americans, and uh, it's crazy. That's how you know that that's how you conquer societies. Actually, uh, you know, in India, the Raj has very few humans, but they manage to sort of use Indian groups against each other very really effectively. Um, so, so I mean, much I, of this is social control. <clears throat> yeah, so much of this you, is social control, and the question is: Does the D Web improve? Does the D-Web weaken centralized social control enough that it actually pr provides an alternative and a, and a way out? Um, and can we go supranational instead of, you know, because because part of this conversation is China will have digital uh, renminbi and will have digital currencies, but those are still national currencies with national taxes. One of the promises of cryptocurrencies is borderlessness. Okay, which is great for criminals. Oops. Um, but is really interesting in terms of jurisdictions and the idea of nation states. So there's, there's a thread in the air about, hey, is the nation state under as much pressure for its existence as General Motors is? I don't know. Um, so there was a uh, international politics scholar named Kenneth Waltz. Uh, he wrote a book in 1959 called uh, called Man, the State and War that re that remains a text that's used in political science in, in the US and actually globally. Uh, Theory of International Politics and he wrote also wrote Theory of International Politics in 79 that um, ha included the classic line comparing business uh, corporations to countries that um, IBM was far more likely to collapse by the by the, the next century than what than was a Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. Because that perspective that that countries had had um, extra had weight that and they would not be changed as easily as corporations. So just what you were saying there, I don't know if it directly lines up, but that just just flashed on that line that stuck with me. Um, and you studied under Waltz, didn't you? Yes, I did. Yep. Yes, I've got him above you in my brain. But you may, you know, all you had to do was wait a little bit longer. IBM turned out to be a little bit resilient, but it is splitting in two. Oh, right? yeah. No, it, it is right in the middle of, you know, doing mitochondrial, you know, um, division and, you know, becoming a business that is focused on more human interaction and a business that is more focused on infrastructure and technology. And it's really, it's, it's a really interesting strategic division. Um, <laughs> I'm tickled. I, I think the point is that, that actually is that it, not that Waltz was wrong. It's that yeah. he chose a really unfortunate example. Um, I know. To make that larger point that, that I think you're right, that if he had chosen, I don't know, France, it would have, it would have been, he would have been right that IBM eventually does you know, engage yeah. in mitosis and but i but i observe you know going back to the star trek episode where captain kirk but you know congratulations shatner we're going into a little bit into space today um, the um is that he gets divided into two captain kirks in this in the transporter and you learn in the episode that you know the animalistic you know limbic you know, kind of Kirk, you know, is not functioning well with only the cerebral prefrontal cortex Kirk, and they got to put it back together to be a functional captain, right? I suspect that this is going to be the problem with IBM and Kindrel, hmm. is that in separating the technology from the human aspects of interaction, that they will have uh, both organizations end up being somewhat dysfunctional, um, 
and that they needed to be together for a longer period of time. All right, but time will tell. Like a, it seems like a really, <laughs> a really strange way to divide the company. Like that's so I interesting. Can't, um, I can't, and Amazon will buy them both. Yeah, it, I mean, the thing is having been an IBM watcher and even went to live there so I could understand it. It boggles the mind. I mean, well, but it's, it actually is true to their core. I mean, they, they, those conversations never really happened in any way. They were viewed as threatening all the time. And they pretended to hire social scientists to help them out with this, but. I mean, they had so social scientists. The only question was, did they have the capacity in a top executive team that mostly tested as being, um, you know, uh, no, they did. I mean, they, that, that's, that is my point. They did yeah. not have, right? And this is just like so, sort of admitting <laughs> that they can't do it. I, I don't know. I mean, I Gerstner decided in an earlier era that the company splitting up into smaller units was a bad idea, and that we needed to stay together. Now that was for a financial engineering reason. Okay, yeah. as much as anything else. Yes. Um, but as I look at this, you know, kind of division into two major thought camps about what business you're in, um, I'm I'm reminded of the early days when we had field engineering. We had a field engineer in the account. They say, "Hey, you're running out of storage." You you know, and yeah. and they say, "Oh, what do right. we do about that? Uh, buy more storage." <laughs> and they would call the account, and they would so they had somebody embedded with the yeah. customer. And, of you know, the minute they got rid of field engineering, IBM lost the capacity to sense and respond to the daily needs of businesses. The new Kindrel that has managed operations and has people with badges, you know, in accounts, IBM is going to lose on the technology side, the yeah. listening and sense and respond function that they've enjoyed, all right, since they got back into managed operations. I, I look, I, I'm going to shut up, all right? Just we'll just observe and see what happens, all right? Um, and I'll take my one share of Kindrel for every five shares of IBM, and we'll see what happens. It is fascinating. <laughs> yeah, it is. I got to go. I was, I was glad to be with you guys for mm. a moment. And yeah, Kevin, thank you. you. You guys are the best. Cheers. <laughs> At least we think we are. Yeah, you are. Bye. Cheers, Kevin. <clears throat> hey, what about what's happening in Europe with the wind not blowing on the North Sea and now and then and Vladimir Putin saying, oh, maybe I'll help you out to prove that gas pipeline, everybody. Oh, let's say the Germans closing down their nuclear reactors and filling with coal. Now the rest of Europe is having to burn a much more coal because the wind's not blowing. Wow, there's a lot going on in Europe, baby. Yeah, yep. yep. Everything seems messy right now. We're in this very weird state. Well, yeah, remember the beginning of the summer when it was like a week and a half, it was like, yay, we're gonna get life again. And then- yep. Yeah. No. Actually, went to a restaurant for the first time in a, in a year. And that was the last time I went to a restaurant. And, <laughs> you know, basically aside from trips to the, trips to the doctor, and a couple of trips to the grocery store during that during that interregnum, uh, I have been in the same eighteen hundred square foot space since uh, March of twenty twenty. So you don't go to grocery stores or anything. You get delivered food. You get everything delivered. Um, Janice will occasionally go. Basically, the the anti. Uh, the drugs I take for my arthritis are tumor necrosis factor suppressors, which basically means they are immune system suppressors. And so I am at a somewhat elevated risk. Yep. So I just don't take, take the risk. Yep. Okay. I didn't realize that. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Man. So I'm surprised you haven't like built an internal climbing gym or a trapeze that or if, if you pan the camera up is there actually in fact a trapeze that's out of sight right now no no okay. that 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 would uh, be based on the idea of me doing kind of physical exercise which it's a concept that's, that's an that's an alternate reality is that like is that happening in a parallel world I somewhere else hang out that's it. it who's here uh, no the uh 
the, the most exciting thing here at this house is just the uh, is Pandora, the the new cat that I, I think I had talked about last time I was here because I know I missed last month, mm -hmm. um, but is still not integrated. We figured that it's essentially she's dealing with uh, kitty PTSD. And she was, uh, you know, she, we got her at six months and that was, she was literally off the street. Uh, she had wandered into Janice's sister's backyard and then she ended up with us. And she has a couple of big scars on her leg and on her belly mm -hmm. from obviously having undergone some kind of violent episode, probably, probably from another cat. And so she's just incredibly skittish around other cats. And not so, him as much. Not well. Not as much. Mm -hmm. um, she she gets bitey quickly. Uh, and it's it's never like a hard violent bite. It's a I'm done with what you're doing now kind of <laughs> kind of bite. Um, and. Uh, so we're doing all the things you're supposed to do to, you know, cross, you know, to introduce smells and have visual introductions and all that. But it's just being a, it's been a very slow process. Oh man! So that means you've so, got to keep barriers up inside your house to separate the cats. Yeah. So it's basically Pandora is kept in a, uh, in our guest room, closed into our guest room with uh, her own uh, spaces and bo litter box and you know feeding area and etc. Um, and we go in there several times a day and every day we let her out for a couple of hours and put the other two cats in a different room oh. and so it's difficult and we recognize that there's a, a significant chance we're going to have to rehome her mm -hmm. um, but we don't want to do it without giving it a full try mm -hmm. because she's when she is on her own she's incredibly affectionate I mean, she, she's the most affectionate cat I've ever interacted with in terms of like coming up and butting her head against you and touching nose and just all the things that you imagine a really affectionate cat would do she does but only when she's alone mm -hmm. so anyway that's the excitement here Maybe if you put her in the transporter and then beam her back, she'll it'll that part of her personality will split off and be left behind. You know, I, I we'll, we'll, we'll give that a try. Okay. Yeah. Just saying. How about you, Susan? What else is going on with you besides a roof? <laughs> That's Damn. not enough. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, I have to admit. Well. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, I keep thinking I'm going to sort of dive back in and, you know, write something. And, I, you know, a conversation like this makes me think. I can't stop thinking is my problem. And it makes me think that uh, there is, a, I put it in a note up there, but it probably didn't grab anybody's attention at the time. But it seems like there's a social phenomenon, uh, call it uh, grace, <laughs> that um, people provide each other. Uh, in ways that systems we have not engineered systems to do that mm -hmm. and and that it's going to be interesting to see i mean if i had another life i might just start over you know with the idea that uh you know let's let's figure out how grace happens now that we've gotten rid of god and religion right uh we used to go there for that and and that's not where we can go anymore nor if I read the situation right, are we likely, without some sort of introspection and understanding, likely to uh, likely to figure out how we're going to keep any sort of grace in the system, and how it is that we are going to interact with it? And I think I think it's as big a deal as trust, Jerry. I really do. I think it's uh, it hasn't quite been noticed. I mean, if somebody notices anything in this department, I, I would like to read it. But my su suspicion is that if we were to look at it the way we look at, at trust or the way some of us look at trust, mm -hmm. which is the, the outcome of interaction. And, uh, and as, as Bo forcefully pointed out, uh, it's, it's not just interaction with other humans, although that is the primary source of it. Uh, but we do, we do grant uh, we do we do interact with machines uh, 
and we slowly begin to give, give them our trust. Um, and, and it takes in a lot of interaction for that to happen. <laughs> Uh, and I think we're going to see see more of that. So, but if they're all going to be very, um, you know, what happens when there is a mistake? I mean, I think it will be, they will be uh, more egregious and less visible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and so what's the, you know, what's that, what's any response to that? I, I just sort of like, I just sort of sit here and think, well, maybe I should just, I don't know. It feels like something that needs to be on the table. It's a spiritual and a religious thing, but it just has to be there. Otherwise, mm -hmm. you know, we will, we will, even, we will, we will just uh, the social construction mechanisms that we have uh, are are going to continue to um, help us evolve communities of practice, uh, of, of tribes, of, I don't know, whatever your favorite word is for all of this stuff. Un, unbeknownst, un, 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 uh, we're, we're unaware that that's how things work. And so I just sort of feel like at this point in my life, it's like, oh, so sad. Once I understood that that's how things worked, you know, it was really very hard to figure out how people might, uh, might take this on. So several things, Susan. First, I love the word grace. Um, it's important to me. To me, it's on my list of favorite words in my brain, et cetera, et cetera. Um, second, it just came up for me yesterday because um, uh, a year ago, I participated in a virtual conference called Unfinished, which was a little Romanian conference that was really kind of fun. And then uh, I mentioned this idea. Have I mentioned story threading to you all before? I think so, mm -hmm. story threading. So I'm, I had mentioned story threading a year ago and it stuck in their heads. So I'm going to be story threading this year's Unfinished Conference. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're pairing me up uh, with a, a, a kind of an artist uh, named Emma. And she and I met yesterday having watched a video, which is uh, Ida Benedetto and Jessica Hartzell just having a heartfelt conversation while walking on the Bay Area Ridge Trail. Uh, and in this, they talk a lot about how do you handle darkness? Like, how do you go through personal dark periods? And, and this little nexus in my brain, are these are my brain notes of their video conversation. And then as a story threader, my job is not to report back on the conversation faithfully, but rather to, tick, to pick an angle through it and make some commentary that might be generative or might broaden the conversation. And so the thought that I connected to uh, that was already in my brain that, that this led me to was how you react to events is really, really important. Not getting your amygdala hijacked, yes, uh, emotional exactly. self-regulation, uh, and then that connects up to grace. Right. So here's here's the idea of grace, patterns of grace, uh, sanctifying grace in Catholicism, divine grace. Uh, there's a whole bunch of things. There's a nice poem by George Hardro called Grace. Uh, grace under pressure is interesting. But now I need to do a little thinking about more about what yeah. what grace means and how this this happens, because one of the things and 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 to be like a little bit mundane about this, but to bring IBM back into the conversation. Um, when I was with New Science Associates and I started our new, I started my first research service for them called Intelligent Document Management. One day, Bruce Barlag, our, our co-founder and VP of sales, came back wide-eyed. They had just visited Dave Liddell at IBM, and he had had my issue of, of uh, uh, my write-up of their Image Plus system on his desk completely marked up in red. And he was mad. And Bruce came back and said, oh my God, oh my God, you got to talk to Dave, you got to talk to Dave. And so several days later, the next week, uh, Dave and I have a conversation. And the first words out of Dave's mouth are, you know, Jerry, I was reading a book the other day, and I don't remember what the book was, uh, and I, I, or, or over the weekend, and I have a feeling that maybe we mean different things by the same words. And we quickly figured out that I had said that Image Plus was neither strategic nor open. But within, shit, within the world of IBM, isn't that funny? Um, within the world of IBM, <laughs> here, ready, and we're back. Um, so within the world of IBM, uh, that offer was both strategic and open. It's just that those words meant completely something different to them than to an outsider like me. And but of so, course they do. That's one of the things about language. So, so he signed up and be, so he became a client, right? 
<laughs> he became a client of our service. And, and I realized that when bad news shows up really, really often, it's an opportunity. And if you can relax in how it shows up. And, and by the time we were talking, I mean, Bruce came back all heated up and excited. And we were kind of excited for a couple of days because IBM was the 600 pound gorilla in our market. We were tech industry trends analysts doing a, you know, emerging technologies. So we really gave a damn about what IBM thought. But by the time the conversation showed up, I was just listening and, and not, I didn't, I wasn't trying to manage the conversation as much as just be there. And he had done some magical kind of work that allowed him to be there in the way that led to that conversation. So that was, that was a big lesson for me that, hey, just because a, an appointment gets canceled, you know, when the appointment gets canceled, maybe it wasn't meant to happen. And the next time you talk, that person will feel like there's a little bit of debt they have to you to listen differently because they inconvenienced you or something. All these things just kind of work in different weird ways. So anyway, that's one tale of grace in some sense. And I'm really interested in what everyone else thinks about grace and what other, what other threads to pursue or how else it hits you or, or anything like that. Because I think that if we can offer grace to the people who are busy trying to melt the world, that's a path to fixing these problems. And grace is one of those languages, one of those words that has religious valence, a lot of religious valence that yeah. might be useful in this setting. I agree with that too. Yeah, well, it's a, it's a, uh, yeah. Yes, the hijack, the- The mental I, hijacking, the, limbic the, hijacking. That was the word I used, started to use a couple of years ago. And I, um, and, and I think, uh, I think that um, it needs to be more, I mean, there are all these things that I'm trying to remember the latest example. I mean, just I just see them go by day by day <laughs> where, you know, the thing that everybody thinks is a very cool thing is, is, is simply reinforcing the hijacking of the amygdala. You know, it's fa happening faster and faster. Decisions are making happen. You know, do you like this? You know, it's like every time I buy something, every time I do anything, and I'm asked to, especially doing all this, you know, buying a, oh, buying toilets, for instance, online, um, stuff like that. Because I'm trying to, I now have running water for the first time in seven years ever here up here, right? I even have running hot water. Ooh, Welcome okay. to the 19th century. Yes. Well, yes. I mean, I told Teddy, I said, it's not even a cold water flat. What's going on here? So, um, and, uh, but then I put up with an awful lot of stuff that my friends think I'm nuts for. Anyway, so, um, but ordering all this stuff and the zillions of times a day I'm asked to, you know, answer a survey. And it, it's like immediately, as soon as I bought something, they want to know how my experience was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, I know, I know we've all had this for years. It's not news, it's not anything else. It's just that it's, it's, it's amygdala hijacking on a scale that I just didn't know existed. With the intent mm -hmm. of understanding your relationship in a way that's destructive to the relationship. It's very interesting. Oh, exactly, which that seems to be unappreciated as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, any other thoughts on Grace? Yes, you know, so when you talk about grace and then immediately talk about IBM, what immediately what popped into my head was Richard Browderigan's poem. Mm. Yes, yeah. all washed over by machines of love and grace. Right, right. Yeah. Oh, that's. Uh, a, what I like that. I'm going to connect that. Connect yes. that up. I want to link to that poem, please. Yeah, I've got it. Grace made me think of M. Scott Peck's books. Uh, I I really love his discussions of grace in in his books. The different. Who's drums. that? M. Scott Peck, The Different Drum, he talks about grace in there, and I really liked it. And I, I think grace is happening all the time. I mean, people, every day, all kinds of people get up and do things they don't have to do. Mm -hmm. This world operates on so much more love and, than, than any, you know, we take it for granted, but it's always happening. Yeah. But we talk about love and we talk about trust, and, and there are individuals, as you're pointing out, that have thought hard, long and hard about it. Um, I just think it's going to become essential to um, maybe go meta on it a little bit. I hope that link still works, but that's the link I have in my brain for the poem from Brodigo. Right. Are yeah. you sending that to us? Yes, I put it in the chat. Uh, I'll, let me click on the link oh, and wait, see wait, if wait, the wait, link wait. is still live. If I'm not, I need to replace the link. Oh, yes. Link said? 
All right, exactly. let's, let's find a new link to the poem. Um, any other thoughts on Grace? I just like the, the I like that's the end of our discussion there. Grace is beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, and all uh, and all washed over my machines of love and grace is also the name of an Adam Curtis documentary, mm -hmm. which is named after Brodigan's poem. Mm -hmm. There we go. Yeah, it builds. Oh, interesting. I think uh, I think the poem published in the Atlantic once. I'm going to find that link, and if that works, I will replace it. Oh no, we can poem. Yeah. So oh, here we go. This, this is actually an article by Alexis Madrigal, who's writing I really like, uh, which mentions both things. It mentions the poem by Brodigan and quotes it, and then mentions, and mentions the documentary by Adam Curtis. So it's a double hit. And we should not be surprised. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, so- I thought, I did want to make yes. one more suggestion, which Please. I was curious about, which was, as the conversation was going on among the three of you, and then when Kevin joined, I thought somebody should monetize this conversation or somebody should, this conversation should, should go somewhere. So uh, to that end, yeah. a couple things. One, I feel, I feel under-informed to be holding that conversation very publicly in the sense of really need to go I know. Sort, sort out more of these pieces. But separately and contradictorily maybe, um, I'm now, I got a little bit of funding from the Jim Rutt Family Foundation, um, a little bit of funding to start a, a podcast called Weaving the World. Wow. Which I'm launching now. Like I'm in, the, I'm in the planning phases now. Anybody who wants to help, you're welcome to join in. I've got, you know, I'll tell you where to look because um, we've got conversations going. This morning at 7 a.m. I had a, a planning call for it. Uh, it's a standing call at 7 a.m. On, on Wednesdays. Um, and uh, to mix metaphors a lot, weaving the world feeds the big fungus. Um, and the big fungus is shared knowledge. It's basically, I'm, I'm I tell the story about leaf cutter ants who can't digest leaves. So what do they do? They bring the leaves in, mulch them up and put them on this fungus that they have a symbiotic relationship with, which metabolizes the leaf matter and oozes a nectar and tasty fungus parts, which all of the ants actually eat. And my curating my brain for 23 years feels, I've always felt like a lone, a lone ant at the fungus face. And I look around and I'm like, where is everybody else? Like Shamay, you create so much good stuff and you post it in the world. I wanna see it kind of as part of the fungus. I wanna see it woven into the shared texture of what we know, what we see and what, what we believe, right? Cause you can, I'm very explicit in my brain about my belief system. And, and, and nobody's looking in my brain. Well, like a, a handful of people are looking in my brain occasionally, but it's stuck in like a Windows 95 looking interface and, and so forth. We're trying to liberate my brain from the brain software. But if multiple people were putting in the world more about how to weave these ideas together in whatever tool they wanted to use, Rome Research, uh, Kumu, the brain, Miro, whatnot. But if we had a way of playing together to think together, um, that would actually work. So the idea of weaving the world is to play that out and to, to visit humans or groups who have interesting ideas about how to fix the world. Um, and there's, there's a thousand or 10,000 uh, podcasts already in the world of people who do a very nice job of that. They have a, a series of episodes where like Jim Rutt has the Jim Rutt show. I just, I just brained uh, his interview with Robin Dunbar of the Dunbar number, which is a really good interview. Like they, Rutt was well-informed. He did a very nice job of the interview. I can, I can point to you, uh, I can point to the interview in my brain and how I sort of deconstructed and reconstructed it. But then what I want to do is have separate episodes that look back on the episodes that look and smell like a podcast where we weave together those artifacts and take apart the things that got said, ask deeper questions, slow the conversation down, and then build this shared artifact, which I'm calling the big fungus. Shareable, share, shareable artifact. Yes, sh shared, in fact, it's in the commons. It's like, you know, uh, and right now, you know, Open Gold Mine has uh, some repos, some repositories on GitHub that are open. A whole but bunch how of. How is this different way? How is this different from OGM? Um, OGM is the container for a podcast that's going to be called Weaving the World. So uh, they're they're similar, except Weaving the World is the name of this thing. Yes. Sounds like I need to use blockchain. <laughs> 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 well, 
Well, well seriously. Give one us of, your principles. <laughs> it's your principles. That's the meat of the thing, you know? So one of the things I am actually very interested in is um, at some point uh, six months ago, John Borthwick asked me, so is Open Global Mind a DAO? I'm like, ah, shit, did you have to ask that? And like, I'm interested. I, like, like, and that's led a bunch of different interesting places. I don't have, you know, I don't have OGM instrumented as a DAO at this point, but one of the sub conversations and, and um, Borthwick has always been interested in the intersection of art and technology. So of course he's busy, you know, investing in NFTs and playing in NFT markets. And he pointed me to a whole bunch of like nouns, NFT and a bunch of other strange ones. Um, and every NFT I see out there is, is sort of like worth, like the artifact you're looking at is just a joke. It's, it's like bad art, sometimes a little bit of good art, not usually good art and meaningless. Like, like it's just, you're, you're, you're betting on its uniqueness and the celebrity or something or other about it and, and so forth. And I'm like, what if we created NFT artifacts out of the weaving the world calls and then put those in the marketplace where you would be getting snapshots of our work to try to make sense of the world with other people with whom we have disagreements. Mm -hmm. that, that would be a meaningful artifact, right? So and, might, and that, there be, might there be some NFTs in that conversation? I mean, it was so heartfelt. I mean, it was a delight to listen to. It was informative. It was amazing to see people really argue and to really take each other to task on things and to hold it together for a sustained period of time. You mean the conversation we just had about uh, yes. blockchain? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I was no, like, I thank God we're not in the same room or Bo would have had me in a, in a headlock. Oh. Well, just kidding. No, no. But I mean, I really, I was really stunned by it because whoever gets to watch that, I felt very privileged. And I shall go okay. back and listen to it again because there's, there was a lot of subtlety in there. You kind of want, you know, the House of Representatives to listen to it. Yeah, thanks, Susan. That was really, thank you. Yeah, You're thank welcome. you. And, and, and that's a big piece of what I want Weaving the World to actually do. Yeah. Like, exactly like that. And, and to slow it down, because you just said, I want to go back and watch it. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I want to go back. And I've been taking some brain notes during our call, connecting up to some other thoughts I shared and so forth. But I want to actually sort of not do that by myself. I want to do that with other people, with other tools in a way that actually builds an asset that we can use together mm -hmm. that preserves our individual points of view, right? So what, what does this shared map, this shared Fairly, memory look like? Well, I think it needs to be, well, sorry. Oh, I have lost, he beat my beat it into my head. Said what we're talking about here is making things shareable, not shared. Okay. Ooh, yes. Nice. And, yeah. Yep. 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 It's a, different, it's a different thing. And 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 what does it look like? So I'm interested in preserving individual points of view, so that the ways we disagree are actually clearly visible and manifest. But then. If you, if you only do that, what you wind up with is this fractal explosion of points of view that's like unmanageable. Well, so, yeah, but the, but the worst thing is, is to have had these points of view and have had them in contact with each other, you know, in a really fertile way. Yes, but and the thing that, I, go ahead. Finish what you're saying and then I'll finish what I'm saying. Okay, I mean, maybe another metaphor, <laughs> another metaphor that comes to mind is um, fishbowl. Uh, you know, back in the day when we were actually doing all these crazy kinds of ways of getting together. And the fishbowl thing was a way of bringing people in on the periphery in a legitimate way to use yep. the whatever. Yep. And uh, so that could that could be part of it. Yep, um, agreed. And we're gonna mess around with formats and stuff like that. So fishbowl format could be really useful. <clears throat> um, so the thing I wanted to add was, uh, to prevent or reduce the fractal explosion of content and points of view, I'm really interested in what does it look like when, when the four of us or three of the four of us agree that this, this sort of tangle of ideas and well-explained concepts <clears throat> works for all three of us. And, and so that is kind of like a collapsing of, okay, this over here is, is like beautiful and, and I, I'm happy to have it represent my point of view and so are two of, of the three of you. That's interesting to me because then we start to converge and connect on well-explained narratives. And I, I did a video long ago in 2010 at the start of Rex. At the start, one of the first video I posted about Rex was called Nug Nuggets, Narratives, and Points of View. Does anybody remember that? Yes, I do. 
<clears throat> oh, good. So, so what I said is anything that's addressable is a nugget. We weave nuggets into narratives that can yes, be retrospective yes. or prospective, and a collection of narratives is a point of view. Yes, and you know how many times you have to go over that in your mind to actually get it, and then you have to participate in it so that you can tell a nugget from a this and a that. And then there's times when you want to know, you know, and then that's a meta conversation. And the, you know, what what happens when we do that is we lose the conversation. So. Unless, we're, uh, unless we become accustomed to doing some of those things. I mean, I think, I think metacognition and meta conversation are really important. Well, and yes. some, sometimes, sometimes the, the freight of doing the meta work loses the thread and, yeah. is, and is an interruption, but, but I'm trying to get to the place where the meta work in fact enhances the conversation. Because you're right, it can totally waylay or, or yeah. you know, hijack the conversation. And it loses people who aren't into that particular meta language. But I never met a meta I didn't like. And at that note, I I need to roll. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Let's let's wrap the call. But thank you. Um, so, and I want to see a recording of the skull too. I can't wait to like review it. Tweet. Exactly. I mean, it as... really, really, go for it. Go for it. And I hope to see you next month. Okay. Excellent. I, we hope to see you too. May the world still be rotating. Peace yeah. to us all. All right. <laughs> Bye.